Well, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, the, time is, the time is now 107. It's unusual. It feels different to get a start in the afternoon. And a quorum, is present a quorum is present. Good. Uh, the State Board of Ed meeting of February 17, 2010 is called to order. Um, we already heard Kathy's receiving a very distinguished honor today from the Federal Bar Association Eastern District of Michigan chapter, and it's the, uh, the Wade McCree Award uh, for Social Justice, and you can just see how she's a natural for that just in terms of the way she's been uh, her whole life. So we're very proud of her, and we'll, we'll, we'll uh, welcome her when she joins the call. I think she's in the process of receiving that award as we speak. Or, yes. Um, just uh, before I go over to approval of agenda, I just wanted to mention that uh, some of us were at a hearing this morning and the board is joining our formal, some of the board members, John uh, Austin as vice president and Nancy Danhoff tomorrow at kind of the, the department's formal bo budget presentation. I had been asked today on kind of a separate issue to join the appropriate committee to talk about uh, our need for staffing this reform division within the department, and the reform division being the one that we have to name two, the 200 lowest performing schools in the state and ultimately either get them to put dramatically bold proposals together that will change the student achievement trajectory in their school or in effect take them over. And we, uh, Liz Bauer joined us today and I think uh, was very helpful in some of her direct comments with uh, legislators to to help us do that. Who joined us? Hi, it's Naya. Hi, Naya. Thanks. So we were pleased, and, uh, and if I may just add one more piece to that, is, is the goal today was to help the legislature understand, and I think they were, your questions were excellent, that um, whether, the, whether the department actually ever takes over any of these 200 schools or not, there needs to be an infrastructure in place to examine these proposals, to monitor these districts and try these schools and make sure that they're on target. And uh, we felt like we got a, an excellent hearing. Um, and then if I may, uh, John's going to do all the appropriate uh, uh, acknowledgments of our guests. And I just wanted to mention that it's, it's seeing Mike when he came in a number of years ago. Um, I was asked to be an advisor to the governor on loan for a while, and I called Mike, and he gave me some excellent advice, and one of them was, don't be a token advisor. Make sure they're going to listen to your advice or, or don't bother. Mm -hmm. And I appreciated that insight. And Tom and I, we've worked together for years. He's an excellent person, as you know. He's very active in reform. He's passionate about kids. And then kind of one of my heroes, and I'm not a Republican or a Democrat, and I, I really work at that my whole career because I think we need to be in a position where we can uh, do what we believe as a department is the right thing for kids and not really get into the politics of it. Having said that, I always thought that Lynn Jondahl had like the characteristics, certainly with his integrity and his persona, uh, to have been a, uh, is a great leader and potentially would have uh, been a great governor and that isn't about ideology, that's about integrity and the other things he brings and so I was so happy when John uh, so these are the kind of people we need to bring in and along with Kathy to help us think through this, uh, uh, these finance issues. And so how about the approval of the agenda in the order of priority? Is there a motion, please? So moved. moved by Nancy Danhoff. Supported by Liz Bauer. All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, same. Thank you. Eileen, please. Good afternoon. Uh, I will first introduce the board members and then department staff and then our dedicated visitors who are here today. <laughs> <laughs> At the head of the table is Mr. Mike Flanagan, the superintendent of public instruction and chairman of the State Board of Education. Um, Kathleen Strauss, the president of the board, as we mentioned, uh, is unable to join, be with us in person today, but she will be uh, joining via telephone as soon as she can. Next is Mr. John Austin, vice president of the board from Ann Arbor. Uh, the next empty chair is uh, that of Carolyn Curtin from Everett, and she is out of state and unable to join us today. Next is Mrs. Marianne Yard McGuire, who is joining us via telephone. Good morning. Good afternoon. Uh, Mrs. McGuire resides in Detroit <coughs> and is the board's treasurer. 
Uh, the next uh, empty chair is that of Naya Hardin. Naya represents Governor Granholm at the board table, and Naya is also joining us via telephone. And next we have Mr. Rod Stevenson, the 2009-10 Michigan Teacher of the Year, and this morning he was in his classroom in the Oakham's Public Schools at Wardcliffe Elementary School. He teaches the third grade. Moving across the table is Ms. Cassandra Albrich, member from Rochester Hills. Uh, the empty chair is that of Mr. Reginald Turner from Detroit, and we do expect Reggie to join us on the telephone here in just a few minutes. Next is Mrs. Elizabeth Bauer, member from Birmingham, and Next is Mrs. Nancy Danhoff from East Lansing, and Nancy represents the board as its delegate to the National Association of State Boards of Education. <coughs> Department of Education staff, Sally Vaughn, Chief Academic Officer and Deputy Superintendent, Carol Wollenberg, Deputy Superintendent, Martin Ackley, Director of Communications, Andrea Post, Administrative Aide to the Superintendent, Lisa Hansconnect, Legislative Director, and I'm sure there are some other department directors who are sitting in their office um, because of we are on MG being uh, taped by Michigan government television, so we do have an in-house feed. Uh, our dedicated guests, Bruce Fay from Wayne Risa and Judy Pritchett from Macomb Intermediate School District. And welcome to our media, and the other individuals are our guest presenters today. So, Thank you, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Why don't we get right to it, and John Austin, I think, is just led this whole initiative in a masterful way and appreciate his his spirit behind this and the whole board taking this on because I think it needs leadership and um, it's going to be provided by the board in in, uh, in April it's a target at any rate. Please John. Um, first let me um, say I have a Kathy Strauss who I know uh, reached out to the three distinguished folks we have today how sorry she is not to be here albeit um, pleased she is to be being honored and have her family and so I know uh, her apologies for not being here in person, but uh, on behalf of the board, we'd like to thank you for coming forward and also just reiterate, uh, <coughs> given the importance for Michigan to wrestle with how we uh, invest in schools and education writ large, how we find continued reforms and efficiencies and deal with uh, the budget realities, but also deal with the reality of the Michigan of tomorrow that we need to build this process of us as a state board inviting uh, stakeholders and experts to uh, help illuminate the issues, provide their recipes for what the uh, appropriate and effective way to uh, think about revenues, to think about investments, to think about reforms in education is a process we began really last year and are having a series of public forums, public meetings dedicated to this topic. Uh, the last one, I think, will be in March 9th at our next regularly scheduled board meeting where we'll hear from additional education stakeholders and perspectives. And I think our contribution, and we're going to be reflecting on proposals that are now in the public domain from the governor, hopefully ones from the legislature, uh, and our <coughs> contribution, I trust, can be and will be to have a bipartisan state board uh, provide its perspective on the right recipe for revenues, investments, and reforms uh, with the best interests of our economic health and our kids in mind. So we expect to uh, deliberate and fashion our recommendations in April at the latest and as soon as we uh, can come to grips with the ideas that are floating in the air. So I appreciate um, Mike, Tom, and Lynn joining us. Mike did a personal note of uh, your individual greatness, and so I won't try to reiterate that, but really appreciate your coming forward. Mike Adonisio uh, is currently the Associate Professor of Education Leadership and Policy Studies at Wayne State. I know Marianne Yard mcguire one of our board members, insisted this whole process would be um, not only incomplete, but irresponsible if we didn't allow Mike to come and tell us what's <laughs> right, wrong, and what needs to change with Proposal A. <laughs> so uh, we appreciate your doing that, because that's an important um, key piece of I all this. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we're delighted then, and I think a so, couple of you have presentations, so I guess we'll do this in turn. <coughs> sort of after Mike um, shares his perspective and we have a little question and answer, uh, Tom White representing the Save Our Schools Coalition, which uh, has many of our education uh, leadership organizations trying to inform the public about the issues around school financing and reforms. Appreciate, Tom, you're taking the time to, to educate us and the public. And as Mike indicated, Lynn Johndahl, former state representative, uh, who's been very active in 
uh, developing and promoting smart public policy uh, proposals and ideas. Thank you, Lynn, for coming. So no further ado, Mike, will you join us at the table? And uh, if you have the uh, two of our folks have PowerPoints, I think. Yep. So yeah, right. we'll get those up. And <coughs> Thank you, Mike and John, yeah. for that kind introduction. Um, and if you've looked at the PowerPoint file, I don't want to alarm you, it's quite long. I'm going to skip over a lot of slides. I want to do this fairly quickly so that we can get into um, questions and discussions. Um, th this th this uh, display is something I, I put together for uh, originally for uh, a workshop last month uh, organized by the Save Our Schools and uh, Middle Cities and uh, Michigan Education Association. So I really started with the basics, and I'm going to skip over some of these slides. But uh, don't, don't first, assume too much. Well, <laughs> when, when, you're sort of, uh, when, when you're when you're talking about uh, school finance policy in the state, a good place to start is the words we live by. What does our constitution say and not say about um, levels of funding? and the degree to which children in various communities should be funded at similar levels. And as you probably know, it turns out that our state constitution does not say much about those issues. In fact, uh, compared with uh, many other state constitutions, it says um, nothing in terms of firm guidance. So we, we have to make um, value judgments and political decisions about uh, the extent to which schools will be funded and how equally they shall be funded. Mm -hmm. uh, really, Section 2 uh, basically says that uh, all families shall have access to a public school to which they can send their children without tuition. Um, uh, John, you mentioned revenues. I, I think when, when we talk about school finance today in Proposal A, what we're, in my view, what we're really talking about is uh, the state of the Michigan economy and our tax system and our revenues. Uh, Proposal A is now 15 years old, and a lot has happened since then. We've had substantial changes in tax law, and of course, we've had uh, uh, this serious economic downturn, more arguably more serious in Michigan than in uh, uh, virtually any other state. But uh, the revenue choices are still before us. Uh, we have. Um, de-emphasize the property tax with uh, Proposal A, and now we, we greatly emphasize the sales tax. Income tax is still very important. And as we'll see uh, a little bit later, right now Michigan is in an, an unfortunate and unusual circumstance where revenues from the big three are all declining simultaneously. That's very unusual. Uh, even if you go back to the early 80s in Michigan when we had unemployment rates that were perhaps even a little higher than they are today, um, the property tax was the safety valve for schools. Mm -hmm. That is no longer the case for Michigan. Uh, uh, people, um, a number of people asked me, if, and they probably asked you too, what happens to the lottery money. If you do the quick back of the envelope arithmetic, you will conclude that uh, in best case, the lottery revenues are sufficient to run our schools for about nine and a half days. Um, here's a, uh, just a little more uh, language from our Constitution uh, that sort of circumscribes our revenue options to some degree. question comes up about uh, the property tax rates that are in place now for the support of schools, the 18 mills that are levied locally on non-homesteads and the six uh, mill state education tax. Uh, those numbers are not baked into our Constitution, but this language in Section 3 of our Finance and Taxation article is. And those rates could only be increased by a three-quarter supermajority vote in the House and the Senate. Um, I've heard some very uh, interesting and well-crafted proposals with regard to a graduated individual income tax in the state. And, of course, we know that that would require a constitutional amendment also. But I think to, to <coughs> seriously discuss uh, public school finance in Michigan, we need to, we need to take a broad view of, uh, of all options. Uh, just a quick look at where our money comes from today. Uh, as we know, most of the money uh, used to operate our schools is state money now, about 70%. 
uh, local money uh, much less than it was pre-proposal A. Uh, if you forward it to this year, uh, this was put together by the House Fiscal Agency, it's basically the same story with some additional funding, uh, $450 million from the Federal uh, America's uh, Re Recovery and Reinvestment Act, but still uh, it's a state revenue story by and large. Um, very quickly, the sources of federal revenue. Um, sources of local revenue, um, the uh, 18 mil non-homestead is the largest source. The rest of the uh, revenue is for intermediate school districts. Um, the school aid fund, all I'll, I'll say about that is if you sort of look at the uh, changes in Michigan tax law over the last 10 or 12 years, uh, the thrust of some of those changes have been to reduce the base of the school aid fund. So the, the, the school aid fund does not have the revenue raising ability that it has had uh, in uh, earlier years. Uh, here's a quick look at uh, the revenue streams that feed into the school aid fund and you can see the big three at the bottom there. That's um, 4.7 billion in revenue from the sales tax for the 0809 year. And you can see the, the state education property tax, very important, as is the income tax, and then a number of um, lesser taxes, including the lottery. Uh, tobacco revenues declining. Lottery revenues generally sort of flat at about 700 million, but as we'll see in the next slide, uh, revenues from some of the big three have fallen. And this, this is a, uh, a graphic that was put together by House Fiscal. And the, the tale that this tells, I think, is that uh, when you compare this year's revenue from major school aid fund sources to where we were five years ago, and I'm quite sure this is nominal dollars, so inflation is another increasing school costs magnifies this problem. Uh, revenues from the big three are flat or falling. As a matter of fact, uh, falling in each for each of the big three, um, and uh, either falling or very low growth from the other smaller sources. Uh, so that's just a very quick look at the revenue side. Um, the other set of decisions that a state must face is once the revenue has been gathered, how is it distributed out to the school districts? Uh, and the states really have two basic ways to go here. The state can decide what school tax rates will be and what the per pupil revenue will be in every school district. That's a foundation approach. Or this, and that's of course what we have today in Michigan by and large. Or the state can l give local voters the opportunity to vote for their own level of tax effort and fund them commensurately. And that was the system we had for 21 years uh, under the so-called guaranteed tax base formula we had up to Proposal A. Uh, what I w I'm going to skip, uh, I, I went into a little bit of history about why Proposal A happened, but I don't think that's on today's agenda. Um, we were hoping to finally learn. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> uh, well, here's, a, here's just a quick sort of graphic look at what the um, Founda Michigan's foundation formula has done. As you know, it has, it has leveled up school districts. Uh, essentially, what we have today in Michigan is somewhat over 300 school districts, about 310 districts that have the same per pupil foundation allowance. And then we have a little over 240 school districts that are above that state basic allowance, each district at its own unique level. Uh, and you can see there that uh, Proposal A was designed to narrow the so-called funding gap, but to never close it. And uh, in preparing for uh, this workshop and uh, a few others, I learned that there was a change in the Michigan law a couple of years ago where the, uh, the School Aid Act was amended so that this leveling up process that we have seen up to the so-called state basic allowance has been made dramatically more ambitious. And now the law says that per pupil funding, if revenues are sufficient, will be equalized at the level of the maximum state basic allowance. Now what that means is that if that were fully funded, eventually we would have about uh, 500 Michigan school districts all funded at the same 
per pupil level and only the 52 so-called hold harmless school districts would be funded at a per pupil level in excess of that. They each would be at their unique per pupil funding levels. So th this change that was instituted uh, about two years ago um, is very ambitious and, and really has not had a, a real impact yet on the distribution of funding across the schools. Uh, here is just a little table showing what the minimum funding levels have been and you can see that the minimum has caught up with the basic funding levels for every year until you hit the year that the latest change was made, 0708, where now the, the stated goal in the statute is <coughs> that all districts will eventually get up to the 8700 level. Um, and here's a, a little graphic picture of sort of the, the, the historic round of leveling up that we have achieved. And then here's a little graphic of sort of the aspiration that's expressed in the School Aid Act. So uh, that, that's a legitimate uh, policy discussion. Should uh, Onaway and Kalkaska and Petoskey and Pontiac and Saginaw and Flint all have the same per pupil funding levels? Uh, here is just a little summary of the uh, dramatic reductions that schools have sustained this year, along with a mention of uh, a, an executive order that was retracted that would have called for even uh, more dramatic cuts in, in school. But essentially the, the, the financial story of Michigan school districts is, I think, uh, steady decline for about uh, six years and this year a s precipitous drop in, in their funding levels. Uh, and when you look at per pupil funding trends in Michigan, you might tend to miss, you're going to miss part of the severity of the funding problem because declines in enrollments have managed to reduce the cuts in per pupil funding. So you can see clearly here the, the trend in memberships <coughs> over the years. Uh, we reached a high point in uh, 2003 and House Fiscal Agency has actually uh, projected continuing declines in K-12 membership. Um, here is a quick look at total state and local revenue for Michigan public schools going all the way back to the passage of the Headley Amendment. And the, uh, the, I guess the quick headline here is that if you look at the year that Proposal A was introduced, 1994, we had the biggest year-to-year -year increase in total funding for schools. It was in part, I think, a, a wise political decision to introduce these dramatic Proposal A changes in a way that everybody could be a winner and essentially they sort of were. But if you compare uh, revenue growth in the eight years after Proposal A to the eight years immediately before it, growth has slowed. And if you look at total state and local funding for public schools over the last five years, it has declined in real terms uh, better than 1% per year, <coughs> which it, the cumulative effect is, is really quite great. So uh, to, to sum up A's success, we, we sort of, I think, attained the, you might say, less ambitious goals. We reduced the per pupil funding gaps, um, clearly de-emphasized property taxes and increased the state share of funding, but uh, revenue stability has suffered, as we all know. And I would say that the, the problems with revenue stability are not uh, entirely a function of Proposal A. It's a it's function of subsequent changes in the tax law and the condition of uh, the Michigan economy. Um, fund balances I want to talk a little bit about uh, because I think that what we see in recent history is a fairly substantial increase in the size of school district bank accounts. And I sort of use this slide as evidence that I think that uh, the people who manage the finances in our public schools uh, have been doing a very good job under <coughs> what's lately been some very trying circumstances. Uh, and I know Tom could, uh, could talk a lot more uh, authoritatively about this, uh, but I think generally they understood the uh, potential instability of the sales tax that we emphasize now to support our schools as opposed to our earlier property tax. <coughs> One of the reasons why a lot of people get upset with the property taxes, it is so stable. Mm -hmm.
your income may go down, but your assessments historically would be going up and the tax becomes more burdensome. But for schools, it was something of a safety valve. And once that safety valve was gone, we saw um, school administration and school unions uh, negotiating contracts in a manner that put money in the bank. And we can see sort of the high watermark for uh, fund balance expressed as a percentage of the operating budget for a year for schools. And we, we were north of 15% for a while. These fund balances, as you can see, have been drawn down gradually. If we updated this graph the last couple of years, we'd see further declines. But um, generally, I think this shows prudent fiscal management. Um, now enrollments have become almost fiscal destiny. Uh, we, you know, we, we've always funded on a per pupil basis, but now any district that uh, is sustaining <coughs> enrollment declines in consecutive years is going to have a very serious challenge. Uh, I'm, I'm sort of a little concerned about the time, so I will uh, um, skip down to uh, just a couple of more graphics here. Um, as I was preparing some material talking about the history of Proposal A, it sort of dawned on me I should at least touch on the, the, the state of the Michigan economy as a whole. And what I did was I went back to the Bureau of Labor Statistics to look at unemployment rates and employment levels in Michigan to sort of confirm what we all know. But if you go back to March of 2000 uh, and you go forward to uh, May of last year, uh, you can see the dramatic increase in uh, Michigan's unemployment. Over that period, according to um, federal sources, Michigan lost 880,000 jobs. Uh, well over half of those jobs were, as you know, were well-paid manufacturing jobs with good benefits. But more dramatically, 44% uh, of those jobs were lost in the last 12 months of this period. So just kind of a, a, a dramatic uh, uh, explanation of uh, just what, what the state of Michigan has been up against recently. Here's a very quick look at uh, history of deficit districts. Uh, you can see back in the early 80s, we had many more deficit districts than we have had lately. However, this graph only goes up to 07, 08, and I'm sure Tom could tell us to what extent <coughs> these columns will be rising this year and next year. But again, back in the early 80s, we were in a very serious recession in Michigan and nationally, but the property tax was the safety valve uh, for school districts. Uh, another concern, uh, rising retirement costs for school districts. Here is the uh, percentage of payroll that districts have been required to pay into the retirement trust funds. Uh, you can see the rates have been dropped on a couple of occasions. That's largely because of an accounting change. It doesn't reflect any ah. fundamental uh, change in, the, in, in economics. Um, perhaps now with the latest changes in retirement benefits for public employees might change the story a little bit. Uh, then finally, I just recast the retirement costs in per pupil terms. And you can see that uh, in recent years, uh, school districts have been paying about $1,000 per pupil into the retirement trust funds. Uh, then last, last slide here, um, you know, uh, going forward, um, these, I think, are some of the new challenges, increasing the age to 18. Um, and then we all know about the benefits of uh, high quality early education and so forth. So I think with that, I will um, invite your questions and comments. You know, Mike, by the way, every time you refer to Tom White, he's back there Googling so that he has the answers, you know, <laughs> when he actually gets up here. He's trying to... And so my Boston College fan friend over here, any questions for the good gentleman from Wayne State? Comments? John and yeah, Nancy? I have a couple and then I'll let others take a turn. One, first, Marianne, you were right. We would have been irresponsible to move ahead without Mike's um, <laughs> uh, education here. There's, there's a piece here that, that is definitely new to me. Can you talk a bit more about this, um, the, the, the basic funding level, this aspirational um, funding piece that was put into our law, what's the articulation of that? What made it come into play? And obviously, we're all interested in for what's the, 
what's an appropriate aspirational level for funding if we can afford it mm -hmm. that does what we need to do. Can you talk more about that? Because well, I wasn't aware I, I of that. Can a bit. Yeah, nugget. I was not aware of that until I was doing some research recently, and I, I actually called um, uh, some of my, my expert sources in, in, fiscal, in House Fiscal Agency uh, to get some clarification. And I, I asked, it was Mary Ann Cleary, and I said, if I let me see if I understand this correctly. This would equalize per pupil funding um, at the level that we have been calling the maximum foundation allowance, which if, if a school district is in excess of that maximum, they are a so-called hold harmless school district. So essentially what that would mean is by today's standards, the aspiration would be to fund all local school districts at, uh, I think the figure was, was uh, about $8,700 per pupil. Mm -hmm. Now that, that raises a question of um, is it really good public, po do, do we have differences for a reason? And I think one reason is that uh, it, at least 80% of the cost of running a school district is to pay people. Mm -hmm. Probably 85 to 90% is to pay people. Yeah. And the, the lion's share of that cost is to pay teachers. And you really have to think hard about the labor markets that are at work in Michigan and how much does it cost, uh, say, an urban school district in southeastern Michigan to recruit and retain teaching talent? And how much would that cost be for Petoskey or Kalkaska or another part of the state. Uh, you know, the, old, the old adage of uh, if you work in Petoskey, a view of the bay is part of your pay. Uh, and <laughs> not to say you, know, you, you, need, you need great teachers everywhere, but yeah. realistically I think you have to ask the question, what does it cost in various parts of the state? Um, when Proposal A was being developed, there was a lot of talk about narrowing the per pupil funding gap as much as possible. But then the question arises, was uh, the, the differences that existed, were they arbitrary, were they ill-advised, or were they based on some real underlying economic logic? And I think you can say that, yeah, there is some economic logic to um, having differences. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody asked me, uh, is, is there a right number? I, I said the range in per pupil funding in Michigan is from uh, 70, well, about $7,100 now to uh, well over $12,000 per pupil. And somebody asked me, well, what's the right number? And I, my answer was, uh, well, there is no single number. There may be a right number <coughs> for different types of districts with different characteristics, mm -hmm. but there's not one number. So I think, I think that's, uh, that's something that deserves some more debate. Nancy, please. Um, I, I've got another question, but to go along with this, uh, and, and Lynn will require, will recall this clearly. When we went through the debate of should we, shouldn't we have Proposal A, I was sitting on a local school board at that time in East Lansing, and uh, we lobbied long and hard in Lansing on that very, very issue that you just talked about. What is the right number? And our, our logic was, one of our, what we hoped sounded logical, was that, um, excuse me, but a year ago you had about 50 of these districts throughout the state that you said were the model districts of what a district should look like, what we should all aspire to. And oh, by the way, those are those districts that you now want to say you can't do what you have been doing because it isn't fair. And so that was one of the huge pieces of the debate at that time mm -hmm. was that if, if in fact, I mean, there's lots of assumptions here, but if in fact, let's say in Okemos, in East Lansing, a Bloomfield Hills, a, um, a Birmingham, if in fact they're doing what all school districts should be doing, educating children at a level that all school districts should be educating them at, providing services both in the classroom and without the classroom at a level that they should be providing, and this is what it's costing, how can you say that's not fair? If in fact, what you're saying now, we should be bringing that up to that level, that makes far more sense to me than it did at the time that we were having this argument. But we could never quite have that true conversation. And so I would agree with you. That's a conversation that really needs to be had. I also agree with you that, that it's not a common number. Mm -hmm. uh, busing in Onaway is certainly going to be a whole lot different than it is in East Lansing. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's going to command a different, a different cost mm -hmm. that, that, we have to, that we have to take into account. And, you know, 25 other 
situations like that. However, getting back to the question that I did have, you talked at <coughs> the very last year about this uh, funding of the uh, uh, the MEPSERS cost. Um, it has been my understanding, from what I've read at least over the years, that although we are contributing uh, an average, and you've got $1,000 per pupil, into the retirement trust funds, if you look at the actuarial tables, that will not cover the true cost of that trust fund. And so that, to me, is part of the debate, too. Are we living on borrowed time mm -hmm. with those trust funds because they can't begin to really fund what they're designed to fund at the level they've been promised. And I don't know if you have any thoughts on that or any? Um, there are other people who know a lot more about that topic than I do. My understanding is that the, um, the health care costs are funded on a pay-as-you-go <coughs> basis. Uh, I'm also, and I know that the uh, Michigan Citizens Research Council has, uh, for, they, they've done a forecast into the future of these costs and the, the publication they put out a few years ago uh, predicts that that percentage of payroll figure is going to, I think, uh, reach in excess of 30 percent. Now these latest changes that, that uh, are being discussed or implemented about retirement benefits for, for public sector employees could impact that. But uh, I think people who look closely at the retirement system uh, do do believe that uh, it's, it's it's certainly not a fully funded system, right. and the liability could uh, increase dramatically in mm -hmm. recent years. So it, it is it is a, a serious because concern. I think that's a real key issue for us as we look forward to how we fund education. We have to figure out how we're going to address that house of cards, and how we're going because it will become part of an obligation we have that whether we plan on it now or not mm -hmm. will have to be funded at some point. And then if we don't have the funds that we had thought we had by contributing annually to this, because I hear people all the time <coughs> saying, well, we're all right, we're all right, we contribute that every year, yeah, but not at the full level. Mm -hmm. So at some point we're going to have to pull from what we're currently doing in today's education to pay for what hadn't been done earlier. And that concerns me greatly as we look at a financial system. How are we going to make certain that we hold harmless our per pupil expenditure for today's students if we don't have funds like this fully funded? And like you said, that may not be something that you know that much about, and I appreciate that, but I think that's part of the equation that we have to consider as we go forward. So anything you can shine on that, any kind of graph or chart you can give me will be <laughs> fully appreciated. But I thank you for that. Sure. Marian, did I see your hand up? Yes, you did. <laughs> I thought so. Yeah. Please. Um, I want to thank you again, Mike, for uh, taking the time to come. And uh, I wanted to uh, ask in regards to uh, proposal A, if, um, if it's wise to be talking about eliminating it, about changing it, um, and if we changed it, what would some of the changes entail? Mm. I guess I would uh, not recommend wholesale changes. I, I see, you know, everybody sees uh, great financial stress uh, imposed on the schools. Uh, I don't think that's principally a function of Proposal A as much as it is tax laws, mm -hmm. the revenue side, uh, but are there uh, changes that could be made? Well, I'll, I'll throw out a couple. Um, I think that uh, the state should look closely at sort of at protecting the so-called at-risk funding for school districts that have large concentrations of, of low-income children. I think that was a very important part of the uh, school finance side of the Proposal A reforms, and I think sometimes people uh, lose a little focus on that. And I think in, in past years, if, if I remember correctly, that funding level, those funds, those grants to school districts have been prorated because the, the state has not been able to uh, fully fund that formula. Um, we talked about uh, the property tax rates not being locked in the Constitution, but of the constitutional requirement of a three-quarters vote in the legislature to increase them. Um, I think it's worth talking about, and I know this is, this is not 
-hmm. popular in a lot of circles, but uh, reintroducing the optional enrichment millage at the local district level. It's now available at the intermediate school district level, but as you know, that that's very difficult to do. Uh, in the 15 years of our proposal A history, we've only had two counties that have managed to pass an enrichment millage, uh, Monroe and Kalamazoo. But um, I do hear from, from uh, people around the state who make the argument that uh, these are our children and it's our property taxes. Mm -hmm. Why shouldn't we have the option of voting enrichment millage at the local level? And then, of course, the counter argument is, well, won't that A, raise prop the property tax burden again. Yes, it, it would <laughs> if, you, if it's passed. Uh, and secondly, would it reopen the, ga the per pupil funding gap between the haves and the have not? <coughs> well, not necessarily. Again, you know, any, any formula can do anything if you have the money to drive it, but the state could power equalize those mills. <coughs> so if a property poor district, their voters approve an additional mill or two, the state could match that with some money as opposed to a property rich district passing a local enrichment millage, in which case they would not get the state aid. I mean, technically, uh, the, the technical part is the easy part here, mm -hmm. but uh, it's, it's another way of uh, increasing revenues available to schools. But I, I think the, big, uh, the, the biggest and most promising avenue, in my view right now, is the, uh, the uh, reform of the sales tax yeah. and modernize the sales tax to bring it in line with um, the sectors of the economy that are growing, and you know, you can, and you know, all the all the negotiating parameters that are involved in in that policy discussion. But I think that uh, it's it's one of the major avenues uh, that are that's, that's available for uh, school funding and for the public sector generally, and bring the bring the tax system into the modern age. Great, Mike. Any other questions for Mike before we go to? Or next. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Mike.